Rowan. Yes, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another brand new Rugby Muscle podcast. And as always, TJ, today we are honoured to be joined by Doug Christophus, Coach Christophus, Coach C, the man. Um, how you doing, my friend? I'm well, my friend. Thank you, TJ. A pleasure to be here and uh, an honour to have met you. And uh, thank you for having me on. Likewise, it's honestly the 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 pleasure is all mine, man. This is going to be like I I think I said this in our chats beforehand. I'm like we're, this is just going to be a good session for the both of us just to shoot the shit, but also uh, you know a little bit of a therapy session because um, the stuff that you've been getting into quite recently with your armored Spartan and stuff. Obviously, you you're a strength and conditioning coach by trade. That's your background, um, and I'd like to know your story of how you got into that. But I think what guys are going to get in for in this podcast is going to be even more uh, deeper than just strength and conditioning and, and what they can do with themselves physically and because it's all kind of inter interrelated, right? I believe so. Yeah, I, I, you know, body, mind and soul, I think it's all connected. I think you, uh, you, you can't have one without the other or uh, you, you can, but I think you, you, you eventually meet the, uh, you meet the wall, you know, you meet the wall. So I think it's important to have all of those. Yeah, there's like you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like you can do all the mental training you want, but eventually you need something physical and vice versa. And, and it is there's like just little checkpoints that you have to make with each of the rungs of the spectrum to get to keep climbing higher. And so, yeah, I um, think so. I think we should even start with uh, your journey, and we can dial it all the way back as to how you got to become the coach you are um, and the speaking that you do now. Uh, what was your journey and, and how did you find yourself being a performance coach in the first place? Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, it's, I've always been into training when I was young, um, but went on to play, uh, you know, I'll give, give you the Reader's Digest version of this, uh, yeah, man. played college football, uh, played at a Division One AA uh, level, uh, enjoyed that particular journey, uh, came out of that, was, a, was basically a teacher, taught at the middle school um, still continued to train, had a roommate that uh, convinced me to apply to some federal law enforcement agencies. Um, I applied, I, I uh, got a job with the Secret Service. I was an agent with them for a couple years. Um, really missed, uh, really missed uh, teaching and missed, missed the students. Uh, again, still continuing my training journey and lifting and conditioning and everything. And so uh, got back to teaching and then uh, angled off into the realm of uh, strength and performance. And uh, basically at the high school I'm at, I, I, I created a position that, that was really unique at the time. And this is going back maybe 20, 24 years ago now. And, 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 and that was uh, basically creating every hour, every period was blocked for each and every sport. And, uh, you know, it took some time to build it, but eventually coming across it about four to 500 athletes, you know, um, pretty much almost 60, 60 kids a period, depending on what sport. And, you know, to give you an example, zero hour would be all my, my cross country kids, you know, my runners. First hour would be football, second hour soccer, third hour volleyball, girls and boys, fifth hour basketball, boys and girls, um, seventh hour softball, baseball. And then I created a summer training program that, that rivaled that. And I'd be going from, gosh, about seven in the morning till eight at night, created a woman's group for the community, created a youth session for the community. Um, just put in a lot of time doing that. You know, one of the biggest thing in creating that program, you know, football here, American football um, was always big and, and they're always taken care of. Right. That's, that's the, that's the thing that brings in the money. So Everybody took care of football. So when I took over this program, there really wasn't a program. And what I wanted to create was equity. And when I say equity, I mean equity with all sports. I don't care if you were a golfer, a tennis player, swimmer, football, um, and equity with gender. I don't care if you were male or female, you know, whatever. Um, I wanted that weight room um, to be a welcoming place, knowing that uh, anybody could benefit in there. And so basically created that uh, along the journey, picked up everybody from amateur athletes to pro athletes, um, started my jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts Muay Thai career when I was 28, I'm 54 now, um, kind of specialized in more of that combative type uh, training. And, and, and here we are, man, I've been really blessed to do something I love for 20, 24 years. And uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey, my friend. 
man that's that's so inspirational it's uh it's pretty cool um I like that uh, what you said about you know the the football guys are already taking care of them or well, not taking care of themselves but they're already really taken care of, and you just sort of saw this huge gap where everybody else was sort of getting left behind and and that's kind of the case you know with the world in these days that everyone is now getting brought up to doing fitness in some sort of capacity like I mean you said twenty twenty plus years ago, I mean the fitness industry barely existed like. You know, and it, so that makes you a, a real OG of the game. But it also means that you had a lot more of chat. You know, well, I, I don't even want to say more challenges. Just completely different challenges. You're not you're not trying to tell people what they're doing is, or they're not as misled. They're just completely uneducated. So, um, I think that was that would be one of the the first questions that come out of that is you're taking these school kids that are you know they're cross country runners, and I'm sure you know 20 plus years ago you're meeting with parents that are saying, hold on, no, 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 especially the girls, as you said, I don't want my kids to be bulky or they're stunting their growth or they're supposed to be runners. Like, why? what are you doing? Oh, you meathead, you're putting them under the weights or whatever. Right. Like, did you get a lot of that? <laughs> you, you know what? You really you really do. You really do. And, and, and so it's, it's funny you say that, TJ, you know, because, you know, there, there's, a, there's a shift in the paradigm nowadays that I'm dealing with, and we can talk about that later. Um, that 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 brings up the mental piece of it that I kind of shared in Costa Rica a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but 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 yeah, you know, back in the day, you know, a, a female cross country runner, what lift weights, and so um, and it's even baseball, right? Um, a lot of uneducation going on in there, and it, what it took a lot of TJ is a lot of really free time, a lot a lot of a lot of just basically. Uh, given of yourself after school and, and meeting with coaches and, and going into the weight room before these classes were developed, right? And, and, and getting, for example, the baseball coach to understand that it's not, it's not bodybuilding, right? This is athletic training, right? And, and, you know, okay, what does that mean? Well, okay, in an overhand throwing sport, like baseball or volleyball, you know, we got an overdevelopment of the anterior delt, so we got to work more on the posterior to stabilize that shoulder, right? And, and you don't, you don't, give it to them in that scientific term, kinesiology term, right? You give it to them in layman's term and you demonstrate. Um, with runners, you know, it was the same thing. It's trying to educate them and look, we're already running linear, right? We're like doing a million, a million lunges every day, right? And so why are injuries occurring? And that's because of that linear motion. So what we need to do is we need to create movements that's non-linear, right? That we're balancing out these muscles again, just like the Baseball player, volleyball player, working posterior to stabilize and balance out the shoulder. Let's do the same thing for the runners. Um, you got to make sure that they understand you're distinguishing between those two items, right? And and as we progress, I'll, I'll share with you a philosophy that I always use when I do a clinic or camp about strength and performance. Um, it keeps me on the straight and narrow. Um, but that's it. It's, 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 it's building that sincerity and trust and getting people to understand that you you – you really care about them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where the trust comes in, TJ. You know, I taught a class at a junior college here. And, hey, you tell me to shut up when I talk too much, my friend, and I'll shut up. <laughs> no, <you're good. laughs> but uh, you know what? I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't implement a textbook or anything like that because, listen, you're going to get the kinesiology. You're going to get the exercise science. You're going you're gonna to get it out the ass of all the textbooks that you're going to use. My big thing was sincerity and love for who you're working with, you know, um, let them know you really care. It, it, it's an energy force. It, it's, that's the soul part of it. Right. For and sure. so, yeah. So, so that was getting that by him and you're absolutely right, man. 20 years ago, it was unheard of. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine the struggles. Actually, I, I can really see it. Cause as much as we think that like the world's getting more and more educated, you realize that you just surrounding yourself by, um, more people that, already know what you're spouting but um i did want to touch on what you said there with the um i think the three things that were really key there that, that allowed you to work with these people and them accept it and embrace it and all that is that uh number one it's always going to be the education because if you just you know um educate people then th then then no longer are they are just list blindly listening to you like they're they're making the choice themselves to do it um, which also entails like not giving them a textbook because if they're not educated enough to understand what a textbook means, 
you know, then that means, again, if, if, if they ever having to rely on you to interpret the textbook, then again, you'll still just end up being the guru. And, and so the third one of that is like, so it's, you know, your education and, and the people understand it, but also the time. Because um, in a world where social media now, we've got clips that, you know, everything has to last 20 seconds or, or be something that catches everyone's attention. And that's, and that's the only way people, that's where people want to, you know, that's where they choose to spend a lot of their attention it can become difficult for people to then, you know, take it a step back and realize, oh, hold on, I might have to educate myself and this might take a lot longer than what I thought, which is, you know, it's a, it's a pain point, but it's the only way, like, to, to reach that land of actually, you know, getting success from these things. Right, right. Absolutely, yeah. TJ. For yeah, sure. that, that's, a, that's, yeah, that's a tremendous piece of it, you know. Um, and, and you hit it right on. I mean, I mean, even, you know what, not, not to get into this, because I'm sure we'll touch on it later, but it's that piece that you said, you know, I was joking around with you about not testing the athletes, right? Mm -hmm. That not, not testing them, right? But, but you have a why to that. And that's the big thing. To me, it's always the why, why, right? And as long as you have an educated why, that's huge. Side note, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I think that crap's overrated, man. And then, like I said, we could talk about that a little bit later, but, yeah. but you've got to have the why. And I think what's important is whether it's clients, athletes, um, your, your, your business, uh, leadership, right? I don't care what it is, is whoever you're dealing with has to know your why. They have to. You have to educate them on your why. And, and if you don't, you're not going to have that buy-in. And I think that's major corporations. Yeah, for sure. And it's like – and that's the um... – the why the important thing with the why is that it goes both ways as well right so you know you need to know why they're doing this so then you, you can tell them why you're doing exactly what you're doing and it's not even just one why it's like uh, i think the rule is five why's you've just got to keep following oh why are we doing this because you need stronger legs why do i need stronger legs well because you need because they're going to help you run for why like you know why 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 and if you get to five why's it means you're probably onto something uh something good and Agreed. i guess that that leads us quite well into if we're talking about why is you know you said you're a strength and performance coach or we you know people will sort of try and pigeonhole you into a strength and conditioning coach or whatever but you've you've already defined there yourself a bit more about performance coach so we talk about you know we spent most of this time already just talking about physical preparation but you know the reason that uh we decided to get you on this podcast is to talk about the the mental side of things and and your recent is it? I don't know how recent it is actually, but your approach to that. So, why did you decide that this is something that you need to explore a little bit more? And, and um, yeah, just if you could touch on that a little bit for us. Yeah, you got it, TJ. No, that's it. Listen, I I, I, I say this to the athletes I work with in the weight room all the time. You know, and, and, and most of my clientele outside of spurts of athletes that get a hold of me, like I said, I don't I don't advertise. I don't. I've been so busy within the school system um, that really when I get asked to do any type of single training, personal training, small group training, I typically have I've said no, um, just because I'm, I'm pretty busy. I'm getting to the point in my life where that, that's probably going to change and I'm looking to do more of that small group, others type of training. Um, me and you will talk eventually about that because uh, I, I, I want to pick your brain at some point down Indeed. the line. but the line and, and and so for me i've often said if you don't have the mind you have nothing if you don't have the mind you have nothing if, if, eventually the physical is going to break eventually that's going to go away i don't care how strong you are how big you are if you don't got the mind eventually it's going to crumble right um and, and so uh, let me digress a second and so talking about strength and performance which i which which it's not to me strength and conditioning right it's strength and performance it's about performance training and when i say performance training i'm not only talking about athletes i talk about the, the general population right B because to me when i define fitness and i define training teach and you'll see where I'm, I'm i'm going with this as i circle back to answer your question to me training and this is going to sound corny in our most primitive primal state training was about survival we trained to survive right that's what it was way back when right um hunting and gathering and climbing and crawling and swimming right i mean all these things to me in our most primitive state fitness is about how do i survive okay and we all benefit from that 
And so when I talk about strength and performance, I use an analogy. And I don't know if you were there the day I used the analogy of a bike wheel. Were you there um, no. on that particular day? No. Okay. So whenever I speak, I use an analogy of a bicycle wheel with spokes. Okay. So if you can envision this bike and you envision these spokes on it, right? If you've got a spoke on the bike that is loose, okay, that's still attached, but it's really loose and really weak. You can still get on the bike and ride it. The bike still functions, right? Eventually, though, with enough of those weak spokes, the, the, the wheel is going to weeble wobble, right? The infrastructure is kind of unstable. And so to me, when I deal with an athlete or I put together a training program, I think about that wheel and its spokes. And every spoke represents an element of an athlete. It represents an element of survival, of training, right? So what does that mean? One spoke, lean muscle mass. One spoke, speed. One spoke, power. One spoke, strength. One spoke, core. One spoke, core uh, uh, mobility and flexibility. One spoke, our fitness conditioning level, right? One spoke, uh, uh, footwork agility, right? And, and I could go on and on, but there are three spokes to me that are the most overlooked spokes that are out there. One recovery. People don't know how to recover. You do a great job. A matter of fact, I, I, I started to follow one of the ladies. I think that you might've had on, she's a nutritionalist. Uh, Marie uh, Stone. Yeah. Yeah, man. What, 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 a between you two, what a wealth of knowledge, man. And, and, and so, um, but that's that recovery piece, right? That nutritional mm. recovery piece, right? You know, how many hours of sleep, you know, are we doing the little things, you know, whether it be the icing at appropriate times, whether it be compression, yada, 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 right? That's one spoke, overlook. The other spoke is nutrition, right? I deal with guys who want to get big, you know, these adolescent football guys, and I tell them, I don't care how hard you train. If you're not getting the macros in your body, if you're not getting the caloric intake in your body, right, you ain't going to put size on. It's going to be very, very limited, right? Mm -hmm. um, back in the day, I remember walking into my first gym, TJ, and you'll get a kick out of this, right? And uh, it was this little uh, storefront gym, California Fitness Center back in Long Island, New York. I was in 11th grade, weighing in about 145 pounds. And, um, you know, I walked in and the owner wrote me a workout. And after about a week, I asked him the question, what should I eat? And he looked at my head and he looked down at my toes and he looked back up to my head and kind of did that like two or three times. And he said, son, I don't care what you eat, eat Twinkies, <laughs> ding dongs, ring dings. You just got to get calories in your body. Right now. I'm not advocating that nowadays we come quite far from that, but calories, nutrition. And now to answer your question in my very long winded way is the mental side of it. That's the other spoke that is so neglected. Um, people don't get it, right? To me, training will always parallel life. It parallels life. I could tell so much about an individual in the weight room by just sitting back and observing, especially in dealing with my athletes, whether I have 30, 40, 50, 60 in there. Um, so that made me really dig a little bit deeper. I've always had the warrior mentality. I want to suffer through training and workouts and things like that. Um, but I needed to delve a little bit more into it. And so that's where I started to really, really get into it. It's always been a big part of me, um, probably within the last few years, even more so probably within the last four months, taking it a little bit further. Awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, what's, what's even more admirable about you taking on this, this sort of journey and, and, um, like getting more into this and, and doing this deep dive and trying to help other people with it is that like you would have come from a background where a lot like yes there are you know there are things that we can always do to improve mentally that will help us grow as people but as far as like pushing yourself in the weight room like that <laughs> from what i can tell and like you you, you know you played um a real high level of football you you, you know you, you you went in a secret service like there <laughs> you're not someone that probably struggles to push themselves in the weight room. So there's got to be a good level of empathy there to even relate to people that just don't want to do it and never have wanted to do it and have had no desire to lift weights, but they know it's kind of for them, you know? Um, yeah. Did you find that a struggle? 
You, you know what you, you do, but I think I think at the end of the day, I think I think again it comes up with sincerity and love when you're talking to to, to to whether it be adults or 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 these adolescents, you know, these teenagers, you know. And here it is. I think we've become, and this is one man's opinion. So don't 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 shoot the messenger here, right? But 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 my opinion is this: we we've become so goal orientated, right? Um, it's about a goal. Right. Hey, so here it is. Jiu Jitsu. Perfect example. Right. I've been doing Jiu Jitsu, uh, gosh, since I've been, like I said, 28 years old and I'm 54. Right, TJ. And um, up until probably less than a year ago, I was a white belt. And it's not because I've had lapses of time in my training. Um, the goal wasn't belts. And I, I don't I don't minimize the value of that belt system because it, it shows commitment. Right. It's a really important thing. It, it, it shows that you've taken the time to do X, Y and Z and learn a skill. Right. Um, but but to me, that's never been the goal. And I think we sell to people in our society in general to set these goals. And I think when you do that, you, you set yourself up for failure. Again, my opinion, because there's a couple things that are going to happen, right? Either I achieve the goal. Hey, I got my blue belt. I'm not going anymore. Hey, I lost the weight I wanted to lose. I could eat again, right? Um, hey, I lifted, I lifted consistently for three months and I got big. I'm there. I did it. You become complacent, right? So, so those things can happen or you discover it's too hard. And you quit, you drop off, you're done, right? So to me, it has always been teaching a journey, right? And it's not about a goal because if we're so focused at that end point, we don't embrace the process, right? There's, there's the word process. To me, I use the word journey. We don't embrace that. When we're outcome driven, it's easy to fall by the wayside. When we are journey driven, we're enjoying everything the highs and the lows and and I, I think that's what you try to teach um is is really embracing both the highs and the lows because that's part of the journey which brings me to the other piece the suffering right it's not running away from suffering it's embracing that and if we learn to embrace the suffering there's so much that we can learn and grow from but we don't because we're goal orientated and the suffering, we don't want that, but it's part of the journey. And so that's been a big thing to try to teach that. Which, yeah. What do you think? Pete? Yeah, I agree. And uh, we'll touch on the suffering a little bit more in a second. But I want to I want to go back to what you were talking about there with the, the goals. And, and you spoke to, you know, we've spoken about it before, like the why, like the real deep down why. Because that's something that I do with the athletes that I work with. It's like, well, first and foremost, I try and show in their, like shove it in their face that, Right. If you want to change, like you have to change, like th like people th forget that they think that they're going to like, you know, some people think they're going to lose 100 pounds and they're going to carry on being the same person. They're just going to eat less and weigh less. Like, no, like your, your right. life will fundamentally change if you want to go through, like you said, a journey like that um, or, or same thing. If you want to be someone that goes to the gym four times a week and you've never been like your life is changing if you're going to make these changes and people aren't, they're not, they're not very willing to do that unless they acknowledge like why, like what, do, what sort of person do they want to be rather than what do they want to achieve. They should look at who do they want to be in order to have achieved those things. And, and then that sort of instills that, like you said, willingness to accept that suffering because they know that that's part of what they've got to do to get to the things they want to be or to be the person who can get to the things they want to be because ultimately I, I think like what's interesting about that is that if we didn't change like if we like if we if we yeah if we, we didn't need to change fundamentally who we are we would already have achieved everything that we ever wanted to achieve like you would have already lived the life and and that's horrible because <laughs> then right. then you're just stuck on the top of the mountain and like I, I wouldn't want that and so yeah I, I completely understand what you're saying um, and I think that's really 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 crucial and um is how do you go about that process with the the kids that you're trying to work with because I, I imagine if we're talking about sensitive folks that probably don't even have a grasp of who they want to be anyway because like why yeah. should they is it yeah, do you, you struggle to get, it, it, to get it to their wise 
Go on. Yeah, you know, it really is patience, TJ, and you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it, it, that's a very difficult thing to to tell a high school boy, right, with, <laughs> with raging hormones and other things on their mind and, and um, you know, the world ahead of them, right? They've not lived yet, although they think they have. Um, so so I, I, I think a part of that is what we said before is relationships and trust, right? They, 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 people that you work with and deal with, whether it's your clients or in my situation, these, these student athletes is, is really developing that relationship and trust. Um, they don't get it, TJ, not at this point in their lives. Um, when they get it is years later, um, when you receive emails and phone calls or you see them, um, you know, at a store, or at a park or in the, or in the local gym. And, and, you know, what you get at that point is, Hey, coach C, I get it, man. You know what? Uh, at, at 21, I went through a dark period in my life coach. And I remembered the things that you told me about the journey, you know, and about suffering and about life and about how training parallels it and about, about, you know, enjoying this journey, the ups and the downs, you know, so, so they don't get it. And I, I think as frustrating as that is, I think uh, you realize that going in, going into the battle, that this is a, a, a long battle and um, the gratification, right, isn't going to be immediate for, for this guy, for the trainer, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be delayed. And it's going to come years down the road from those kids, from the parents. And so you're not in it because of that. So it, it, it is a hard thing, you know, but you hit on a key word, too, is 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 and I called it owning. Right. You got to own you got to own your shit. You got to own your stuff. And I think what you were saying about people don't realize that they're going to change, you know, and you got to own that you're going to change. Right. And you got to own where you're at right now. And you got to be real about, you know what? man, my workouts for the last month have sucked because my mind has been preoccupied with something it really shouldn't be preoccupied with. You got to own it. And then only until you own it, can you make those changes necessary, man? So you, you hit on a, on a key, key point in the whole stratosphere of, of, of for me, the mind piece of it. Mm, yeah. I think the other one that you've spoken to me before about, and uh, I really enjoyed, and I think this is the, what sort of gets us into this next stage because we're talking about, high school kids where, you know, or anyone as well, but no, no, nothing exemplifies this more than high school kids. And when you tell them, like, just chill out, like, you know, uh, you know, kids complain about not being the popular kids and, uh, you know, all the problems at school. And, I, I, and I, I've got a couple of guys that I still work with the, uh, in school and, and, some, and, like, they put so much pressure on themselves for every game. And it doesn't matter how much I tell them, listen, dude, like, no one gives a shit about these games right now. Or no one gives it, like... You're going to look back on this stuff in 10 years' time and just think, oh, I wish I'd have loosened up. But their perception is like, no, this is mm -hmm. the most important thing ever. And I'm never going to, no, if I make a mistake, I'm a failure for life and I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And, and they, there's some, some sort of disconnect there where they can, it's so hard to, to sort of pull that uh, curtain back from them and say, listen, no, look, you're going to be fine. Like, no matter what, like, you, you're, you're, you're just a kid. But they don't want to hear it. And, uh, I think that's where you said you, you you've spoken before about the you know perception versus reality, and I think people go and we do it until probably until the day we die. We we you know, we let our perception of things cloud the reality of the situation. Um, and uh, where do you think a lot of people go wrong with that in terms of yeah training or that journey that they want to be on? You know, it, 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 absolutely, TJ. I, I, I think the perception reality piece of it works a couple different ways, right? And, um, you know, one, with what you were talking about in the example that 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 that, that you gave about the, few, the couple kids that you work with, you know, that are still going to school and things like that. And obviously, I believe they're playing rugby. Is that is that mm -hmm. where they're at right yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, Man, if you talked to me a few years ago, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get slightly off tangent and then I'm going to come right back, TJ. Doug, that's so, why you're on here, mate. I want to, I want to hear you go all around, all around the bases <laughs> before bringing it back. That's fine. It's a dangerous place, my friend. But, yeah, <laughs> like, no, this is, this is. Had you talked to me about a few years ago, I think my mentality, and it still is to a certain degree, 
was one of very much competitiveness, competition, 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 success, 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 kind of a hard driver, right? As of late, uh, and, and I'm really being transparent here, I, I, I think I've changed a little bit. And it's a change for the better, because I think somewhere along the line, we become so focused on winning and we become so focused on success that we lose a little bit of ourselves. We lose a little bit of peace and happiness, right? We lose a little bit of that soul peace, right? Um, I'm envious of you, my friend, because I feel like that's something I've got to work on. Here you are traveling, right? Um, not because, unless I'm totally mistaken, this millionaire who has yachts and jets and you're able to do it. And if, and if you do, then I want to kind of just come and travel with you. Like, right? <laughs> no, right? I, I wish that. That's the funny thing about the, the travel life is, I, you know, I, st I will still look back on people who, before you even like say that you're envious of me, like I, I get it quite a bit, but I look at everyone that's got their sort of, their, their, their world all in order and they've got their family, they've got their clothes, like, part of the travel life is that you sort of give that up, you know? And so uh, even just to go back, I'm cutting you off before you've even had a chance to say you're envious of me because that's how defensive I am about it because I'm like, it's not real because I'm still going back to um, Colorado to coach because I still miss that community. So that's still something I want to get back to. But um, right. Yeah, and, and I, I think more so, TJ, and, and, and I apologize the word envious, right? It, it, what I mean by that, envious of the freedom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, envious of the freedom of your soul. And, 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 and that's what I'm saying. Not envious because, oh, he gets to go to all these places, right? Yeah, and, and don't, and don't get me wrong. Like, I'm still proud of, of what I've managed to, to, to yeah. sort of engineer for myself here. But, uh, yeah, yeah, carry on. No, it's, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's <laughs> awesome because I think it says something to the soul. I, I you know, and, and, I, and I think as I've gotten to the point I'm at right now, the one thing that you did say that that makes a lot of sense of, of missing is family, right? Um, you know, Shauna is my better half. She's my everything, is my best friend, you know? And so that is, you know, when I, the big sacrifice that you have. Um, but going with kind of what I was saying is your, your success is not measured by the size of your paycheck. Your success is not measured by the title in front of your name or after your name, right? Your success is an internal success. It's, it's a soul success of, 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 of peace and happiness. And that's not to say it doesn't come with problems. Everything has problems, right? And so where I was going with me um, in my change and my shift, I think we've been jammed down our throats this competitive, and again, don't get me wrong, I think when you do something, you do it to be your best, your best, is the word, right? Um, and so going to the kids that you work with, that's something that's not only their perception, but that has been made to be their reality by the coaches that deal with them, the coaches that jam that down their throats, or to be quite honest with you, the parents, you know, about that. And I'm guilty of that. It's what I did for years, you know? Um, and so that perception is constantly built on because that's who they've become. That's that's the thoughts that have been put in their heads, which brings me to the other part of it that's been a recent part of it with me. And that identity piece, right? The, our identities is how we interpret things, right? And so these perceptions, they become interpreted because of the thoughts that have been either we've come up with or been jammed down our throats. And so... Um, that's a tough thing because it adds this baggage onto our lives, especially these young kids. And so, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I remember, I don't know if it was last year, actually it was a year and a half ago because last year was COVID, talking to the football guys and, and having them, you know, uh, sitting on the floor in the weight room in front of the white board. And, you know, the football coach at that time asked me to have these talks. He was a good guy and he trusted in me to have these these deep conversations, you know, in that way from, and it was, you know, he, he said, I don't know what's going on with these guys. We, we, we step out on the field and we're just choking. We're just not playing. And so when I asked them, you know, what are you guys thinking about when you step out onto the field? You know, what, what is it before they, before you even start? And it's things like this, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to drop the football. I'm afraid I'm going to miss a block. 
I'm afraid I'm going to let the coach down. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my position. I'm afraid I'm going to throw an interception, right? And so the example I gave is I had a kid stand up and everything that they were telling me, I'd, I'd put a 25 pound plate in the kid's arms, you know? And, and pretty soon you got five, six, seven of these 25 pound plates and they're going to fall. But that's what they're going into games with. That's what I think we go into life with. We carry all this baggage that's not based on reality, but perceptions, right? And it weighs us down and it, it fogs us and it creates fear and anxiety and worries and uh, uh, inequities that we feel about ourselves. And so I think that's where perception becomes the issue. And I'll let you say a couple of things. And then I want to give you the reverse of that, where perception doesn't have to be. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, what you were saying there, it, it, it's, it's spot on. And the way I sort of see it is with, with competition, it's like, it's great because there's nothing better than, than competing. And, and, but at the end of the day, all it is, or all it should be, is a sort of measuring tool for, for where you're at. And if you lose, like, the, the struggle is to make sure that you've put your best forward. But if you've put your best forward and you lose, that's great. That's just feedback. Like, that just means, okay, here are all the areas that you've got to work on. You know, maybe you, you lost because you got, uh, you know, your opposition was faster than you. Or maybe, you, you know, you, you, you got out fought. Well, these are areas then that you go back to the drawing board and you work on again. And, and, and then you try and win. But the, the more I've done this, like, I've, I've played rugby around the world. I, you know, you, I've seen... I've, I've, seen people that have achieved ungodly amounts of success but they walk down the street and no one cares like it's not right. and and that goes right. that that talks to the sort of identity is that the perception is that our, our wins or our losses are who we are and if we can sort of dial that back a little bit and just say okay that's just a, you know we're a competitor and we want to win but in every competition there are going to be there are always going to be more losers than winners and so just by the fact that you're competing means that you, you're, you're going to eventually at some point be in that losing bracket. Um, right. And so that's the, but then the perception is that the winner and the loser is that's your identity. That's who you, you are forever. And I think that that forget that, that, that forgets the point that, oh, well, you're going to compete again. And so right. uh, each time you get another chance. And I think that if we put so much pressure on each competition, like it's our last, then that's where the, I think the issue comes. Yeah, no, uh, you know what, he's absolutely agreed. You know, it, it, I think that's the thing, because if that's what you're solely basing everything on, um, gosh darn it, you're, you're carrying that with you to the next competition, right? And that perception just grows negatively, you know? Um, and, 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 and so, again, I think it's really important to balance that out. And I agree with you. I, I, I think life is competition. Right. I mean, you go into you're going to compete for jobs, you're going to compete for a mate, you, right? You're going to compete for a million and one things, you know, and, and, and so I think it's always important that we own going back to that ownership, own our our, our, our flaws, own our strengths. Right. But base them off of realities and not perceptions. Right. Because I think, again, that's what's going to create problems, not only in competition and not only in the sports world but again i go back to how do we become a better version of ourselves and humans so even in dealing with our spouse or relationships or friends right if if we base how we react and this is just a stupid example if we base how we react off of somebody's facial expression for example right oh they got a puss on their face so you know what they must be mad at me and so I'm going to have a puss on my face and I'm going to ignore them or I'm going to treat them like X, Y, and Z. That's a perception. We don't know what has gone on in that individual's day, right? And we've, we've, we've acted on a per perception, which only creates more of an issue. And, and I think that's what we do every day in our ordinary lives. And that's why I said to you earlier on, to me, the, the training room, training parallels life. It parallels life in so many, so many ways, especially when it deals with the psyche um, and the mind and mm -hmm. the mind. Let me reverse it, though, if I can. Perception, to me, also can play in a positive way, right? To me, perception becomes an issue. And you and I kind of talked about this a little bit, and we didn't get real deep. 
in my most recent months and what I've been dealing with, the warrior mentality of being a hard driver and you've trained your ass off so you could get through anything, right? I met a wall on that. It wasn't working. I couldn't control emotion. My emotion was getting the best of me, created a downward spiral in worst case scenarios over and over and over again. And, and, and not being able to get a grip of the emotion is what's created the problem for me, right? And so without getting too deep into me delving a little bit more into the brain and a little bit more into the ego, meaning identity, that, that's what really kind of helped me out, right? So perception to me can work in a positive way if I can control my emotion, right? So think of a little kid, a, a little kid thinks they could freaking do anything. Yeah. A little kid has, right? They have no fear. They they think they could run faster than a freaking the fastest sprinter or keep up with them, right? Because that's their perception. They've not been taught reality at that point, right? So when we have that mentality, that could be a pretty powerful thing in propelling us forward, right? Um, gosh, my, my dear old Greek mom, God rest her soul, and I shared this story in Costa Rica. When my children were young or playing soccer, I would take them to the park and we'd do mini hurdle work and we'd do some agility ladder work, you know, and we'd kind of play like that. And when my mom came to visit from New York one time, she came with us to the park. And here's this, you know, 70-year-old Greek lady who's not had an athletic bone in her body. But what's her mentality as she's watching the girls do this? Oh, I could do that, Doug. And I'm looking at her going, mom, you've never done anything like, oh, I dug, I can do that. I do things like this every day at home. It, her perception, it's what made her so strong and positive, right? And moving forward, you know, mm -hmm. um, that could become a powerful thing, yeah. I think. I, I, it's funny you say that because that's just made me think about, uh, and I, I've, I've thought about this a few times and I've used it as, as a lesson for a few uh, of my athletes before, but um, more with the teams that I coach, is that like, I, uh, when I was like, I can't remember if I was like 14 or 15, and we had a county trial. So like, you know, you're playing for your, your local club and then you've got your region or whoever. And um, we had trials coming up and um, I knew I'd be good enough to get into that squad. But, uh, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna use these next few weeks of training with my club to get ready for that. And um, we, we started, um, we started doing, you know, tackling practice for the first time in a few weeks and whatever. And there's one guy, there was one guy on our team who, you know, when you're 14 and 15, you've all, you're all half, you're at different stages of puberty and whatnot. There's one guy who's a full grown adult and he was on our team. And I, and, and I remember he took the ball and I'm like, everyone is scared of tackling this guy. So you, it ends up always taking like three, three or four kids just sort of halfly grabbing his shirt until eventually he goes down. And then, I, I distinctly remember a thought that went straight into my head of, well, if I'm going to play for this county squad, then tackling this guy should be no problem because he's not even good enough to get the trials. Mm -hmm. And so instantly then I became like, that was how I started tackling. And I, I tackled everyone and anyone and everything. And it was literally because of this perception that flipped in my mind. I said, oh, actually, hold on. Right. I'm like, I know I'm good enough. I, I know it. I, like, that's it. Done. I'm going to tackle this guy. Right. And, because... Ask me a week before, and and maybe I wouldn't have said it out loud, but I would have been hesitant to tackle the kid. And all of a sudden, right. I just flipped my perception, and, you know, the rest is sort of history, I guess. Yeah, yeah, positive thing, right? Because here's the thing, if we look at that exact scenario, and again, without knowing, you know, the kid, you, you are even basing the fact of, I'm, you're going to play, I'm going to play on this county league team, Right. I believe that's what you said. Yeah, and yeah. this kid would never be able to play on that, right? Mm -hmm. But but how do you know that? That's even a perception. That's yeah. not a reality, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. but but you used it and you twisted it to really I don't want to say give you superhuman strength, but in a sense it, it made you stronger. And I think if we are able to use our perceptions in that manner, I think it's a positive thing. I think if our perceptions create an emotion that is one of fear and anxiety that we can't get rid of, then we really got to take a step back and make sure that we are looking at reality. And I don't think that's a difficult thing. The separation of those two things is not difficult. Actually mm -hmm. doing it when you're dealing with that emotion is a really, really difficult thing. 
Yeah, for sure. It's it's one of those things. It's like uh, well, you said you you've coached uh, uh, when you had the groups for the mums as well and and helped them out. How many times did you put a weight on a bar and they say, oh, how much is that? And, and don't tell them because then they won't be All able to time. lift it. Yeah. All the time, brother. <laughs> All the time. You know what's so funny, man? I just right now I have a a, a group of uh, uh, volleyball girls, um, and they actually uh, again I'm just. I, I guess we're reinventing Coach C the, the, this year, you know, a little bit and kind of uh, doing a little soul search and trying some different things, you know, and it's the first time that I'm doing some small, small group training. And when you come out to Arizona um, and uh, stay here, you'll, 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 you'll see my home is like this mini facility, right? It's, it's got everything. And so I'm doing some training at the house. And one of the things that I'm doing with these young ladies is I, I want to empower them. Right. I, I want them to understand that they're badasses. Right. I, I want them to get that. I want them to 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 be strong women and not physically strong, but mentally strong. And so, you know, when you look at some of the videos of me doing underwater kettlebell work, right, or underwater high knees or, you know, you look at there's one out there and I don't know if it's still up there. I was working with a jujitsu guy, one of Jay's jujitsu guys, and we were doing a workout that involved a whole bunch of stuff. But the last part of the workout, it was a high intensity workout of going through different movements, including the heavy bag. But at a certain point, there was a band around the neck mm -hmm. and around the weight, right? And there's tension on the band, right? So you're basically being choked a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a, in my backyard, I got a little uh, archery set up about 25 yards out into a bale of hay. And so, the, the, the finale of this workout, the last movement, and you're cycling two, three times, is with the band around your neck being choked and around your waist pulling you back, you know, you're shooting, you know, three arrows as quick as you can trying to relax, right? Well, why? Why? Well, it, it, it has minimal physiological benefit in what I'm doing, right? There are some. There's always physiological adaptation to stress, right? But it's more of the mental thing. It's more of developing that perception, right? That I'm a badass, that I'm crazy, right? That I could do anything. And so when you look at the ones of me underwater doing X, Y, and Z, some of these kids look at it, you know, and they're, they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. That's crazy, right? It looks hard, but it's not. It's not hard. It's the mind that makes it hard. You just got to have a willingness, right? And so I had these girls in the pool the other day doing it. And not for the length of time, baby steps, but there was a sense of pride, you know, because it, it, there wasn't that perception of, I'm going to get hurt. I can't do it. You know, they shed that perception. They trusted and they got, they got a nice little thing to put in their, uh, their little container that says I'm a badass, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And I guess there's, there's, there's something to do with identity there as well. Right. Is it like, it's very easy to say, oh, well, Coach C does this because he's a, he's a crazy person, you know, he's, a, he's an absolute machine. But me, I'm just whoever, like, I shouldn't be doing this stuff in the pool or, yes. I'm, not, or I'm not able to do this stuff. And I think yeah. that sort of leads us on to, you, 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 you touched on it a few times already, but where do you think identity does come into all of this? And, and how, how can we sort of get a little bit better in our perceptions? Yeah, I like that, TJ. I like what you just said, man. That, that's really intuitive, you know. And again, that's why I enjoy these conversations because I, yeah, I feel like uh, I learn and grow. You said it earlier, right? Therapy session a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, that's the, yeah, yeah. They, that's what they've held on to, right? That they can't. And I think that's what we do. Um, you know, so, so, so just um, to kind of backtrack just a little bit again, you know, for my longest time, I've always, you know, it's on my, it's on my wrist, uh, says suffering, right? I, I don't know where the hell oh, yeah, the, 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 the camera reverses, it confuses it. everyone. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh my God. But, you know, it says suffering and then there's a semicolon on, after it, right? Because I've always felt, I will never, and again, I touched on this at, in Costa Rica, I will never experience the kind of suffering that that homeless mom in New York City, in the middle of winter time, living in a box, trying to raise a kid. I'll never experience that type of suffering. I live in a middle class neighborhood, have a wonderful job, um, beautiful house, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, right? It could all go away one day, right? But, but right now, I'm not experiencing that. So the only way I could experience 
any type of suffering is through my training. That's it. And, and, and that's why I like to be crazy and I like to push it. And people will look and say, you're an idiot. What are you doing in 115 degree weather, carrying a big old slosh pipe and lifting it, you know, every, every hundred yards doing different lifts, Olympic lifts with it. You know, you're an idiot, you know, but that's the only way I could experience that. And for the longest time, I felt that that would help me get through anything. Those kind of workouts. No matter what anybody did to me, said to me, hurt me, I can get through it. And and recently what I realized, like I said, probably back in uh, early January, I realized, man, there's so much more than that. Why can't I shed these negative emotions that are killing me? Um, why can't I just get them out of my head and suck it up and barrel through this? Because it wasn't working. You know, my, my old formula of choice, consequence, perception, reality, owning and discipline and suffering, just something was missing. And just really started doing a lot of reading and really started to discover this whole thing about identity, you know, for me and, 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 and ego, right? Ego mm -hmm. being identity. And, and what I discovered is the things that were impacting me were just thoughts, that's what it was. They were thoughts, you know, so to be to sound really silly, you know, and, and it's so minor, but it's amazing what something so minor could do to us as an individual. Everybody's different. So to one, it's like, really, that's upsetting you. But to you, it's the end of the world. Right. Based on the identity. And because I've been coach C for so many years, what was going on threatened that identity. And in threatening that identity, the brain says, and the ego says, we better hold on to this and we better do whatever we need to do to hold on to this. And it creates chaos in our lives. You know, it created chaos in my life. And I won't get into, you know, the detail, 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 but it just became this worst case scenario of a downward spiral. And so, again, you hit on it. Our identity becomes this, this force that really has us interpret things in ways that sometimes are not very healthy, you know? And again, dealing with emotions okay and having emotions okay, when it spirals out of control and it begins to control our lives and, you know, makes us insufficient or, or, or not doing the things we love to do, I think then there's the problem. And so that's what I really rolled into is more of these things are bothering me, not because I'm Doug Christophus, the husband, the, the father, the, the worker, because I'm Coach C, mm -hmm. which is, you know, like Prince, a symbol, right? Who the hell is Coach C? You know what I mean? And so in, in starting to discover that, um, it's it's been really good, man. I don't know if that answered that question, TJ, or at least. Uh, no, it, 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 it definitely delves into it because it, it makes me think about, like, it is, the, you know, our own, and that's why we are so sort of afraid of failure because if we fail, we're letting down who or what we perceive that identity to be. Whereas yeah. if you can sort of come away from that a little bit, separate yourself, just realize that you're, that's a part of you, not you, then failing is, is okay. And like, so I think people find that a lot. Like it's, it's hard to change. Like, like how many people have been the, you know, the, the fat funny person, and really just deep inside, that's, just, that's their identity because that was a coping mechanism because they were uncomfortable or because, you know, maybe just they were funny anyway. But then that meant that they had to be fat and funny. And maybe they are happy. And if they are, that's, that's absolutely fine. But I know a lot of people that have changed that. Like they, they've gone, oh, no, like this is, this is just like, I, you know, humor was, and, and it's good that they develop that humor, but it sort of stuck them into that pigeonhole because we like to keep people in pigeonholes, you know, and we, and, because we like that as, as tribal beings, I think we like to do that ourselves then because then that's going to get us accepted. So, you know, your, your coach C, that means that you're accepted. That means that people know who you are straight away. They'll come to you right away and, and they'll respect you right away because you're coach C. It's the same reason like in, um, in jujitsu, we wear belts. Immediately that's our, you know, we don't say I have a purple belt or I have a brown belt or whatever. We say I am a, I'm a black belt. Like I am... Right. Like 
What is that like? Right. It's, it's so funny. Right. And, uh, right. You, you, you're not. You, you, I am my thoughts. Right. Yeah. I mean, I am. Right. You're not. You're not. And and we know this, TJ. And I, again, I'm not certainly. I take nothing away from the belts. I think that's. I, I you need that. I think that's wonderful. Right. Because it, it it just. It it, it it shows that commitment through the years. Mm-hmm. But you and I know, just because you're a black belt, that don't mean you don't get your ass kicked by somebody who's a freaking white belt, right? Mm-hmm. That just might very well be one hell of a freaking wrestler or one hell of a freaking athlete, right? Um, so again, even there, I guess where I was going with our identity sometimes steers us in the wrong direction, right? Yeah. I'm a black belt. I should be phenomenal. Nobody should beat me, right? All of a sudden, you discover I am beating beat. Man, I'm a black belt. I'm the I'm the instructor. Gosh, I don't want to be an instructor anymore because I should be winning. And that's not the case. It doesn't mean that you should be winning everything, which you touched on earlier. Yeah, here's one I bet you get a lot, and or I'll I'll go there via rugby because it's it's what I always like to bring it back to is that we get. I get a lot of people that come in and and they 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 play in the front row, so they're they're they're, they're, they're scrummaging a lot. They're the physical positions. They're the big guys, and they you know they train like powerlifters and they're strong as anything. And then I say to them, well, or even because they found rugby muscle, they're into their strength and condition already anyway, so they're pretty strong. And I say to them, okay, like you've already accomplished that in terms of strength. Like getting any stronger, the amount, how hard you've got to work to get stronger. It's not going to make you a better rugby player. You now need to get fitter. And they don't like that because they're ident- they, they, they've fallen mm-hmm. into that. I don't know if it's a trap, but they've associated them, their identity with being that strong person. And they're afraid. And this is even before we even touch on the fact that physically, like to maintain strength is so much. It's, it's really not that hard. You know, like one session a week, if that, you know, you can maintain, right. at least easily maintain your muscle. If not, you know, you'll get it back as soon as you start doing it again. But because that's our identity, and I still struggle with that, man. Like I still struggle. Like I'll get programs given to me where I've only got to hit the weight room twice a week, and I'm like, oh no, my gains, my gains. I can't, I can't right, only hit the. Right. But I know, even though I know, like physiologically, I'll be absolutely fine. Even though I know that this is the best program, still because my identity is that 220 pound guy that steps on the jujitsu mat or is the big guy, you know, that does rugby muscle, I I don't like it. Like, but. It's only when we actually understand that that's you know, that's just a part of who I am, and that's not even so I'm going to lose any of my gains anyway. It's just that right. we see it as an attack on our ego. We see it as an attack on our identity. We, it's yeah. It is a. Uh, it's difficult. But going back to what I was saying with you is that like I, I, I can imagine you get that a lot. Is people with their especially guys. And I don't know about high school guys, but maybe high school football players or just people that want to be seen as tough they don't like other people to do their programming because they'll see that I, you know, I found it like women are so much more receptive to receive training because there's no, there's no ego there in terms of having to be someone that knows how to get strong and stuff. Whereas guys, I think, and I've said this for the longest time I've been a trainer is guys are sort of hard headed. There's a, there's some sort of innate pride in our identity in having to do our stuff ourselves. You know, we don't take directions too well, (laughs) you know? And, um, there's a there's an ego drop that has to be done in order just to receive a training program for someone to say hey let let, you, let me let me let you get me strong right uh, do you find that happens right. quite a lot like do people are res- resistant to, i mean yeah, maybe it's different you know, for you because you're this big tough former secret service guy that uh, <laughs> like if I, if i want someone to get me strong i'm going to talk to you right yeah, they, now you know what though, Tej. It's, it's funny you say that because was the the piece that I struggled with for years. And again, when you talk about identity, you know, ego used to bother me, but but I shed it a number of years ago. Um, it used to bother me a lot. R- really, in essence, who am I? I'm a glorified PE teacher, right? I'm in the high school system. I'm a physical educator who created a nice little niche in the strength and conditioning world, performance world of that high school, right? created a flagship program that other schools try to mimic and yada, 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 right? Um, In reality, I'm a PE teacher. And so in our area of Ahwatukee, in this area here, being an upper middle class area, there is, listen, you you, you know, know, personal trainers and trainers are a dime a dozen. 
It's a multi-billion dollar industry and the storefront properties are left and right, you know, and that's who I compete with. And that's a really difficult thing. And for years it bothered me because who are they going to go to? Doug Christopher's PE teacher or, you know, John Smith, you know, former NFL guy who has an establishment down the road. And so again, it goes back to the long haul. It goes back to the patience. It goes back to the sincerity and the love and what beyond the weights are you giving to these individuals, right? What lessons of life are you giving them? How are you creating parallels to their lives and how are you giving them the whys, you know, of what they're doing, um, you know, to, to speak to what you're talking about strength. How do you convince that individual? And, and it's not an easy thing sometimes, um, especially when you get into the adults who have strong level of arrogance, you know, that there's only so much strength that you can gain, like you said. And at what point does, does that bell curve kind of plateau or start to curve down, right? There's only so much speed you're going to gain from strength, right? Eventually, that's it. You're, you're powerful enough, so you're going to be this fast. There's no more power that I can add that's going to make me faster, right? And, and, and so I think, you know, as you go into the whys and having these conversations with them, again, that's why I go to the wheel. And, and what I call it is training totality. You know, I, I'm not just going to train one thing. We're not power lifters, you know, which going to what you say. And I'm almost forced into it because I got to deal with a multitude of coaches who don't quite understand the strength performance world, who think I got to have strong football players and really don't understand movement. Right. Don't understand evaluating doesn't mean I'm evaluating your bench press or your squat, right? Or your deadlift or your clean, right? It means I'm evaluating your movement to find deficiencies, right? Yes, I incorporate all those movements in my workouts, but man, I'll do a, I'll do a, a, a movement uh, just for shits and kicks, you know, uh, kneeling, single kneeling. I mean, when I write my movements, they're like paragraphs, right? They're like sentences, the, the, the movement, right? Single kneeling, kettlebell clean, to standing position to press, right? It's a freaking mouthful. But what I'm doing is I'm creating a move. Uh, I don't even call them exercises, a movement that puts them in motion. So I can watch as they're coming up into a standing position, are their feet on the even? You know, I'm evaluating, does the right knee buckle in? Does the left knee buckle in, right? Is there a lean left or right? Are the, is the core engaged, you know? What's happening to the press? Is there mobility in the press or do I lack motion? And so it, it, there are movements, you know? And, and so people get caught up, like you said, in that strength, strength, strength. And you got to try to, as hard as it is, explain to them that it's totality. It's one spoke. Strength is one spoke. I'm incomplete unless I hit all of my spokes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and the, yeah, so the, the problem with identity comes when we associate our identity with just that one spoke. We, f we forget the wheel because right. that's, that's the thing I usually say is like, you know, you're, you're this strong, but you're a rugby player. So you're not your squat. You, you know, even only in powerlifting are you judged by that. Um, and mm -hmm. actually, Last week, we had a, a former strongman who now is running 48 marathons in 48 days. And he, um, John Clark, he, he said that what he had to do, and this is something that I use as a trick all the time. Actually, I, I use different tricks, but is he, he had to change the lift slightly. So because of, you know, how much he used to squat, he knows his squat's going to go down. So then he would change it to a front squat or a poor squat or a slow eccentric because he knows that, uh, even though he knows the process of that he has to get weaker and or, or he has to he's going to lose the amount he can squat he he's okay with that even then it's still hard to shed that identity or shed that ego of knowing what that lift is so you then change it sometimes what I'll do is um, like if I, if we if I have clients that have, have finished a fat loss phase and they then they move into like a muscle gaining phase or, or whatever or vice versa or whatever I just get them to change the units on their scale because then they forget that what that number represents. Yeah. Something I've been doing recently is uh, because um, with with uh, I'm doing quite a lot of running recently, and I've changed from my speed on my watch to from kilometers uh, or from minute kilometers to minute miles. 
So now I'm not longer, no longer, so because I've got to work the, the right heart rate zone. Otherwise, I'll mm-hmm. just associate, like, I'll, I'll just push myself too fast and I always run too fast because I'm associating myself with faster numbers that I used to be able to run. And so yeah, I've yeah. had to change You know what's that. interesting, TJ? Go on. I don't mean to cut you off. What's yeah. interesting is we talk about perception reality, right? Yeah. So what have you done? You really, you, you changed the per, you, perception. Yeah, yeah. Reality, reality is the exact same, 100%. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But you used it. I love it, man. I love it. And that's the way you manipulated that, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome. But th- that, but that's like, that's you have to, and even though it's a stupid trick, like it works for myself, even though I know that I'm tricking myself. It, it's, which, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to do it because that ego and that identity can become so strong which I know you've said before can be also be a good thing. What, how can we use our, you know, that, our strong identity to uh, yeah. harness the power yeah. of it? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. You know what? And, and uh, you actually said something again that, that, again, I knew this would be so beneficial for me, man. Uh, I, I look forward to just talking as friends, to be honest with you, yeah, too, um, down the line. But, you know, you said when we were talking about the strong man, you mentioned the spoke. Right. You brought up the spoke that that's that's he's identifying with that one spoke and that's it. And it hit me. It really hit me that. Using that spoke analogy in life in general. Right. And not being tied down to a singular identity. Right. Or any identity at all. So let's look at the spokes. Right. For me. You know, again, I like to use me because uh, I'm being transparent, right? Mm-hmm. Spoke, Spoke C, Spoke, Doug Christophus, Spoke, Educator, Spoke, Father, Spoke, Husband, Spoke, Friend, Spoke, yada, yada, yada. I think when you look at it like that, you don't get so hung up on that one identity that that just drives you crazy, you know? Um, it's interesting you said that because mm-hmm. I found in Costa Rica when I really kind of looked at the identity of a husband, right? I, man, it took my mind off of everything else, right? And I, I think we get so focused in on that one thing. And so, um, yeah, it was, that was awesome you said that, man. But going back to your question, I think it's the same thing as perception, TJ. I think I think by, you know, being able to as long I keep coming back to this, as long as what you're doing doesn't hurt others or elicit emotions that you can't control, right? Emotions that are negative emotions, emotions that are going to create anxiety, worries, and fears that are going to take you out of who you are and how you ordinarily behave, right? That, that are going to impact how you are to your, you know, your girlfriend, to, you know, your significant other. Are you, are you married, TJ? Uh, I've got a girlfriend. Okay, so your girlfriend, right? Things that 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 take you out of that realm and impact those relationships, right? Um, that's where the problem lies. When when that happens, I think if we can change it to that positive scenario, um, whether it's perception or identity, like you've done with your watch, right? And even identity. I'm Coach C. I'm a freaking badass. Mm-hmm. I'm Coach D. I do freaking X, Y, and Z. This is gonna bother me. This isn't going to bother me, right? If I could flip the switch in that sense, then we're good, right? And that's what I always thought through my physical training that I could do. But that's where I ran into a wall with that. That wasn't working for me. So learning that identity piece has now helped me so I can use it in a positive way. You know, when somebody says to me, oh, this is perfect, man, um, I, I coach at Jay Pages. I do a, I do his wrestling class for his competition team, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, I do a striking class for him. Tonight I'll do striking Muay Thai um, just for fun. And there's a young man there. He's uh, on his competition team. He's in his 20s. Very well read. Good, good kid. And, and, and it was quite a compliment. He came up to me and he said, you know, I've read um, David Goggins' book for the sixth time. He said, uh, you can't hurt me, right? And he says, he said, coach, I want you to train me. He said, because you are the closest thing that I know in real life to that guy. And I just want to be around you more, right? <laughs> Man, 
te tears in the eye, right? That's what we want. We want to emulate that, right? So, so if I could take that and say, really, man, and you're letting this other little shit that's going on because of X, Y, and Z bother you, and this is how somebody else sees you, man, that's a strong identity, dog. Take yeah. it and run with it, right? That's where I think it could be beneficial if it's not eliciting negative emotions and for sure. we're holding on. To and all you're going to do with that is is help the kid, man. Like, that, it, yeah, that's awesome. And, and beca again, because of his perception. Oh, cool. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um, all right, so uh, I know we're running over here, so I, I want to get to my last question because I think this is really important as well is, Clearly, you said, you know, some of this stuff that you've been exploring has only started less than six months ago. You said you started a lot of this in, in like January, man. So I think it's clear to see how much you must have grown already in that time. And I think what we're discussing here today, like, might really sort of set some, set some light bulbs off in some people's head and that they start to think about this approach and, and what they can do better and... Uh, like just to, to begin exploring this because they, they've been enjoying what they understand. Because I think when you came to do the, se the seminars that you did, I think um, a lot of the people that were on the mats, everyone enjoyed it. Like um, both, uh, both the ones I showed up to and everyone that I've um, spoken to about it, like everyone said, yeah, this is, that was really good. But none of them said that that would be something that they, you know, or, or any conversation I've had with them before would indicate that that's the sort of thing that they would, would have actually sought out themselves. So I want to try and make sure that if someone's listening to this and they've thought, Jesus Christ, like these guys are touching on some points that I've never really thought of before and I really think can benefit me with my training or with my life. Um, what are some ideas or some prompts or uh, some avenues that these people can go down to sort of dig deeper to be able to explore these thoughts and uh, ideas a bit more? Yeah, you, you know, I, I, I think it goes back to what you said earlier on. You know, I, I think you nailed it, TJ, and, and we used a different word for it. Um, you use the word, they've got to understand that they're going to change. They've, they've got to accept the fact that somewhere through this process, they're going to change, right? Um, to me, it's owning it, right? Own, own, own our inequities, right? Own our shortcomings, Um own some of the emotions that we feel and, and i think when you own stuff i think you'll stop at nothing to get better to learn more etc so for me honestly it's, it's just doing a lot of reading you know it's, it's it's really beyond for the longest time it was more about navy seal books and jocko and you know goggins and all incredible incredible individuals who 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 I think uh, emulate that kind of spirit, right? Um, but I think what I needed to do is read a little bit more on emotion, you know, read a little bit more on the brain, right? Um, and, and, and I think I delved more into that. I, I think a willingness to talk about it, right? Uh, a, a willingness to, to hear what other people's thoughts are about it, you know, um, to ask questions. You know, I don't think I'm giving a great answer, TJ, and I think because... Here's why I think as I'm sitting here processing this, I think it's an individual journey. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I think we as humans, you hit it before because of our identity. I think we have uh, a little bit of arrogance. Right. And I don't think we look at our shortcomings or are willing to look at them sometimes um, and want to become better versions of ourselves. Right. Um, and I think that's what limits us. Right. Um, and I, I think having that willingness to look in the mirror and say, man, why does this bother me so much? Or, man, do I really work out hard? Or is it just a perception that I work out hard? Because if it's a perception I work out hard, then that's my reality. And mm -hmm. if that's my reality, I'm not going to work out any harder because I already think I'm going to work out hard, right? So I think owning these things and delving into our own journeys um, – really help us you know and really will steer us in the right direction um heck i think you're a great resource i think you know throwing you some questions where you can ch chat back to them or we get together again and answer questions you know um whatever works for you my friend yeah i appreciate that um funny enough 
the more we've been talking on this podcast, the more I've thought about uh, I have a, um, a, a small two-week course to get people to really understand the mindset of what you need for rugby strength and condition, but it can, but it's like basically what you can use for life, but it's applied in the realm of rugby strength and conditioning and it's called rugby muscle kickoff. I'll put that in the links below. Um, I, I think you mentioned about David Goggins and, and Jocko and they're, they're, they're obviously quite classics. Um, and there's some books and I think that you, what you said was really good is that it's a completely a personal journey. Um, because I think that what you said is great about how, um, you always want to like, we, we, as a society, most people are afraid to recognize their weaknesses and, and see their shortcomings because they're, you know, because the ego doesn't want it to see them. But in order to change, you kind of have to seek them out. And what I found sometimes can be uh, negative is going too far that way. And like, because it, it can be an addicting process cause to, to, to see a weakness, address it, get better. Like that's powerful and it feels awesome. So then you start seeking out more and more and more weaknesses to the point where you can't even take a compliment from someone who says he he uh, he, he you know he's a little bit envious of the traveling life that you live. <laughs> so, right, right, right. <laughs> it can like it, it happens, go. and and so I think that there is a lot of digging deep that we can do, but there is a point where we just got to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and let's fucking do it because sometimes we get yeah. like because the you know, you, you read enough um, of these sort of types of books and, you know, the self-help industry book. Yeah, they, there are now just so many that, right. like, you just, it's like we should have, if, if everyone just implemented the things that they know they need to do, they wouldn't be needing any more books, but we've got to keep producing more books because they, they make money and, they, and it feels good to sort of uh, think that you're making that progress. And, uh I've spoken about it before. I've I've called it the the um, post Tony Robbins seminar syndrome, where yeah. you know you get all that energy and you're like, yes, okay, now I feel awesome. Let's go. And then it comes to doing the work, uh, that uh, becomes a little bit harder to actually put it in. So there yeah. is a real big balance, and I think yeah. you're absolutely yeah, I, right I agree to, to frame it the way you said it. Yeah, and again, you go back to the journey, right? They get a, that's what I mean when there's a goal. Hey, my goal is to get better. Well, shit, it, it, people are going to discover it's too hard to really look in the mirror and own your shit, and they're not going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. But when it becomes a journey, an individual journey, it is. And I agree with you, man. It, it's, it's, there's a point of too much, right? There's a point of, of putting yourself in this downward spiral of digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, right? And you can't do that. And that's why, again, I go back and say it's individual. Come up with a few basic concepts of what it is that's really – impacting you and, 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 and go get it, you know? And I don't think it's not going to be found. Can you get things, little bits and pieces of things? Yeah. But it's not going to be found in the book of how to be a Spartan, you know, how to, you know, how to be a ninja, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be that. I, I, I think this is an individual journey of you identifying some of the things that potentially uh, impact you. And then you're going with it. And that's why for me, it was that simple, simple formula of choice and consequence. Choose my words, choose my, 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 my tone, my actions, right? Choose those knowing the consequence, know my consequence first, that if I address my wife in such and such a way, the consequence is going to be her response like this. Right. And, and so simple concept, perception, reality, simple concept, owning, and then having discipline, simple concepts. And that's it. And the only two other things that are really added were more of not specific books, was more of understanding emotion. That was it. It was a simple, probably a freaking old book. I don't even know where the hell it is um, on, on, on our brain and emotion. And that was it. And so that's it. I apologize for going off there on a rant. No, you're Sorry. good, man. Because it's true. Like people always are. Oh what's another book I can read? And sometimes I, I, I give the answer as well. It's like, don't read another fucking book. Just, you know what you need to do? Like, do it. Like, cause it, it, it's, uh, becomes mental masturbation at some point. You know? Yeah. You can, sure. man. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, let's wrap this up because I've taken up so much of your time here and, and I really appreciate it. And at this point I'd say that anyone 
to that has any questions or stuff get in touch because i think we'll definitely get you back on and we'll do a repeat of these and smash that like button ask any comments in the comments below because we'll revisit them as we come back but this has been awesome um what does the strength and conditioning industry look like or what does strength and conditioning in general look like in 20 years time and we still be involved uh, you know what i love what i do i love what i do i love being with the athletes um I, my hopes are yes. My fear is no. I, I think when you deal with uh, the um, bureaucracies, you know what? Let me rephrase that, man. Going back and doing my own thing and not having to deal with a hierarchy mm -hmm. or, or drama or politics. Yeah, I love it. You know, yeah, I love it. Um, but the other piece of it, nah, not, 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 not so much, man. Yeah, for sure. But uh... You don't need that to be used for strength and condition. I, 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 I don't see you going anywhere. <laughs> um, what's one song everyone needs on their gym playlist? You know what's crazy? I was thinking about that, man. I, I love that question because I kind of listen to everything, man. Um, you know what? The other day, it was crazy. I'm sitting there doing lat pull downs, right? Um, because I went to the gym on that day. I got a bad hip, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit more machine work than I like to do um, the last couple months here. But um, I'm doing a lat pull down machine and and uh, just processing as I'm doing it a lot of what we've talked about, right? And uh, the song comes on by the Hawaiian guy Israel. I forgot his last name. Um, what a wonderful world, right? <laughs> Fuck yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, and I start getting a tear in my eyes as I'm doing freaking lat pull downs, <laughs> man. And I got tears rolling down my eyes, you know. But so so my range is huge. But one of my favorite songs that I love, that there's no way that I could ever be in a bad mood listening to it, is by Harvest Moon, Dancing in the Moonlight. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just can't be sad listening to that song. I'm also putting What a Wonderful World on the on the, on the the playlist too, man. This the, this playlist is getting better and better each week. That's, that's awesome. It, yeah. And I don't give a shit. Like, if you're listening to Harvest Moon, Dancing in the Moonlight, and you're, and you're doing your heavier squats, you're still going to feel like a badass. I, I agree, brother. I agree, man. <laughs> All right. And so um, where can listeners get in touch and follow you and uh, find out more about what you do and, and, and uh, pick your brains a little bit if, if you're going to welcome them, of course? Yeah, you know what? Um, we, can, uh, we can put my email on there too, Teach, and they can reach out to me. Um, like I said, man, this is a new, new venture for me a little bit. I, I've, I've been kind of in my locked up in the basement, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Been very uh, focused on that school for 20, 24 years. And I'd love to do more of this stuff. I'd love to branch out. I'd love to get involved with TJ and Rugby Muscle and, and open up an American side of this over here in this world with you, my friend. So um, <laughs> let's keep at it. So man. I really don't. I'll What's put that? all the links. Oh, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. We'll, uh, we'll get you back on and we'll get some questions in and, um, yeah, that's the best way they can do it is, is I'll put a, I'll put a, uh, a, a link up to the Facebook group and they can ask any follow up questions there because this, this has been great. And I'm, I'm sure people will ask some more questions. Sounds great. TJ, I, I much respect and uh, appreciation for you having me on. I really do appreciate it. Look forward to a continued relationship and chatting and uh, we'll go from yeah, there, brother. Man, this has been great. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, sir.